Hello, this is John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of MotorOne.com, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. Today we'll be talking about Nissan's decision to kill off the 370Z Roadster, as well as the cars we're most sad to see go in 2019, and we'll also discuss Aston Martin's new Vantage AMR, which has something that refuses to die, namely a manual transmission. Joining me this week is MotorOne.com Senior Editor Jeff Perez. Hi, Jeff. Hey, guys. And the other chair is being filled again by writer Christopher Smith. Uh, how are you doing, Chris? Doing really well, everybody. Great. Um, so let's jump into the first um, topic, which is Nissan killing the 370Z Roadster. Now, what we know is that it will have a 2019 model year, but it won't have a 2020. Um, that means it will leave the coupe um, soldiering on by itself. And as far as I know, we still don't really have any idea uh, when the next generation Z will come, um, what it will look like, what will power it, and all of those details. We're still pretty much in the dark. Um, so let me throw it around to you guys. How does this this news strike you of um, the 370Z Roadster dying and what it means for the coupe itself? So Chris, what? how does it strike you? Um, it was coming. I mean, everybody, I think, knew that at some point Nissan had to say, okay, um, this platform, this car has basically been unchanged for the last 10 years. We either need to do something with it or just let it go. And um, looking up sales stats a couple of days ago, um, I believe Nissan only sold something like like 33 or 3400 370Zs total last year. Oh, wow. Not, that, that, that's not broken down by Roadster Coupe. That's total. So That's a, that's a bad month for most cars. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. And... Now, I'm a fan of the 370Z. I've been a fan of uh, of the Z car really since it came back as the 350. Um, and, and prior to that, too, with the uh, with the older 300 ZXs, I'll have a, a Z32 in my garage one of these days. But the 370, you can't just let a car like that go for 10 years and, and not do anything. It, it didn't even really get a power bump. The Nismo, I think, is up to 350 now. But that car is almost $50,000. The Roadster still had the 332 horsepower version, the same power that it made back in 2009. And I mean, I mean, Dodge has made it work with the Challenger, but they've continually reinvented that same design substantially up the horsepower. We don't have know? a 700 horsepower uh, 370Z right now. It's right. To be happy and about. we have all kinds of special editions, though, that are appearance packages. And and Jeff, I know you have uh, you have some pretty strong opinions on it, too. It's just it. It was it was time. It was time. I don't think anybody's really surprised. And, and the question about this now is, does this mean that the uh, the coupe is going to go away soon as well? Yeah, I mean, it should theoretically, right? To your point about the Challenger, Dodge has done so much to keep that car relevant, right? Just up in the horsepower, adding crazy packages to it, and Nissan hasn't done anything to the 370 other than the Nismo, which that came way too late, anyways. So. Yeah, I, it, it's time for the for the Roadster to be done. It's probably time for the Coupe to be done. But the problem with Nissan in general, I guess, is that they just they let their sports cars linger for so long, and that includes GTR. Yeah, correct. Now we have we have gotten some news about GTR that the next generation probably won't be a hybrid. So at least at least they're talking and hinting about next gen GTR. I feel like we haven't even gotten that about a next gen Z. So I'm really soft on whether on knowing whether or not it will even happen. Let me ask you this, Jeff. Do you would you want it to come back in the same form, you know, front engine, rear wheel drive, you know, straight gas power plants? Or would you like to see it evolve into something new, you know, maybe plug in hybrid, maybe who knows, maybe all electric, like a, you know, high performance leaf kind of thing? I think I'd like to see it evolve a little bit, maybe nothing too dramatic. So I think what Nissan has that they they implement really well is that new VC turbo engine. I think the the QX50 has it and the new Altima has it and that is a that's a great engine, right? So just a little bit more power out of that I think would be perfect for a new 370. I think if they wanted to innovate to your point, uh a plug-in or a hybrid version would make sense, right? Because the Miata doesn't have that, the BRZ, the 86, they don't offer that, which a lot of people like, but I think there's a new generation that's going to want that. And if you're going to 
if you're going to keep building sports cards, I think you sort of have to do that. And I also think that, um, for one, it would be like a poor man's Acura NSX, right? If we had like yeah. a plug-in hybrid performance sports car from Nissan. Also, we're already used to the Nissan 370Z being really expensive. I feel like it, it has grown in price over time, despite the car not having evolved. So, you know, if it started above 30 for a plug-in hybrid sports version, that wouldn't be too shocking to people. They're, they're used to this car being um, a little bit more expensive. I mean, I, I agree with you guys pretty wholeheartedly. I would say like, man, you look around at the segment and it's, I mean, you can't really say that the Z compares directly to the the u.s pony cars the mustang the camaro and the challenger but it really does i mean they're you know it doesn't have a it doesn't offer a v8 but it's a rear wheel drive coupe starts at similar pricing it plays in that field and you look at the advancement of the pony cars i mean we're living in a golden period of of muscle cars in the u.s um that the z could be playing in but nissan has just you know let it completely wither i think there is still some charm to it um when i get behind the wheel of one i certainly feel that but i gotta say not to the point where i'd want to put my own money down to get one over a mustang a camaro or or a challenger i was gonna say i I have to wonder if nissan uh if if executives maybe aren't kind of biding their time a little bit to see how the new supra takes off to see what happens there because if you want to talk about competitors i mean the supra right now with the 370z I mean, it, it's it's almost a straight up uh, straight up match. You're right. You're exactly right. And and perhaps they are waiting for that, but I don't know what they expect. It's going to sell out. You know, there's so much pent up nostalgia and demand for a Supra that I think at least for the first year or two, it'll have they'll have no trouble moving a lot of them. Um, but it's a question about you know year three, year four. Is that going to be? Is the Supra going to be a sustainable nameplate, um, selling consistently every year, or is the you know Is the hype going to fade and it will go away? What I wish Nissan would do is get a little retro and go back to the 300Z of the 90s. That was my favorite Z car. That thing looked like the future, but it was also kind of understated. It was definitely, to me, as attractive as the RX-7 and not not nearly as bland and boring as the Supra of the 90s. Just a, I would love to have one of those in my garage too. That's definitely on my wish list. To your point, John, I think the Z is positioned so strangely, right? Because you can't get it with a V8 like you can with Mustang and Challenger, but you also don't get, you know, a four banger like the BRZ. And it's like, okay, what are we doing here? Because you're either on one side of the fence or you're on the other side of the fence, and it's kind of weirdly in the middle. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me, you know, market wise. And then to say that, you know, they should bring back the retro nameplate, that would be awesome because Supra's, Toyota did that with the Supra, Acura did that with the NSX, and I think it's time for Nissan to kind of do the same thing. I would personally love to see the Fair Lady, you know, name oh, yeah. global, right? That would be cool. That would be very cool. I mean, I would say the vast majority of average people in the U.S. probably have no idea what it means. But yeah. man, for those who do, it, it the Fair Lady name uh, does hold some sway. Uh, I also think like, you know, going back to the 90s 300Z, the engine in the 300Z in the 90s was very revered. Um, you could get it naturally aspirated or um, twin turbo, if I'm not mistaken. Um and the 370, the 3.7 V6 and the current one, I don't feel has, no one has the same reverence for that engine. It's kind of, uh, in terms of engine technology has stagnated, in terms of like power for the time has stagnated and, and been passed by. So I'd like to see the Z get an engine that's kind of worthy of that reverence, um, you know, and, and something like a twin turbo, something to, to create a little horsepower war maybe between the, the super and the Z, um, just like we have the horsepower wars going on with the American muscle cars. That would be, that'd be amazing. But I don't know. I just don't see, I don't, I don't see the interest from Nissan in developing that. And that always bums me out because I feel like you can judge how fun um, it is to work at these automakers by the types of cars they come out with that don't always have the straightforward business plan. But you can just see like somebody said, that's cool. And I can't guarantee it's going to work, but I can at least guarantee that people are going to look at us and say they're having fun 
and that's a cool car. Um, and I don't see Nissan playing doing that at all. I see Nissan with a lot of its product choices lately just being extremely safe, you know, um, cleaving very close to the all crossover, you know, lineup. And I don't know. I don't see I don't see a lot of fun there. Um, so, but this topic about cars dying definitely makes me think about all the cars we have that are going to the great beyond in 2019. Uh, and of course we keep a running list on motor one of these cars. I think the list is up to 17 individual cars that are dying in 2019. So it's a particularly brutal year. Um, so I want to hear from you guys, what is the car that is dying in 2019 that you are most sad to see go? So, um, Chris, we'll start with you again. What What's on your list? Ford Focus is right up there. Obviously, it's not dying um, around the world, but it is dying in the United States. It's it's always been, I think, a, a fun to drive offering from Ford um, for folks that aren't really on board with the whole crossover movement right now, which I know that segment is growing smaller and smaller every day. Um, I I think it's a mistake. I think it's a big mistake that Ford's making. And has has a hole uh, pulling out of the automotive segment in in terms of cars, in terms of sedans and hatchbacks. I just I I can't help but feel it's just a huge step in the wrong direction. And I don't say that because I'm not a huge crossover SUV fan. They're extraordinarily practical vehicles, and the sales show that. But you still have a very large segment of buyers that are interested in hatchbacks and sedans, and to just walk away from that um john i i think it might have been you a while back in, in an editorial that said don't use dwindling sales of sedans as a reason to bail out of the segment because you know what toyota and honda still have vehicles i think in the in the top 10 yeah i was talking about um i was talking about the hyundai sonata i think the new one that is just so gorgeous looking and i think has a real shot at um, succeeding in sales as a sedan because, and, and I actually said this to somebody at, at, at Hyundai, I said, I think it shows that the, the sedan is not the, the sedan or the car or whatever you want to call it, isn't dying or doesn't have to die. We just have to make better cars. And I think exactly. Hyundai did that. And I think, you know, you know, Honda and Toyota do make good midsize sedans. I don't think they make them. I don't think they have the secret sauce that the Americans don't. They have a lot of momentum on their side. But I look at Hyundai as the example of just make a better car and your cars will sell. Exactly. Um, and that's what Ford needs to do. If, if they, they're just going to abandon the segment by saying nobody are nobody's buying our cars. Well, that's because you need to do a better job. And I'm, I'm very sad to see the focus selling overseas and not here. I think it would I think it would surprise Ford if they sold it here again. Yeah, I, and we should fill in the picture a little more because not only is the Focus dying in the U.S., but so is the Fiesta and so is the Taurus. So all right. all cars from subcompact to compact to, to you know midsize, uh, the Fusion as well to full size. Four four nameplates are dying in the Ford brand to re be replaced only by crossovers. So. And really, that's one of the reasons why the kit list for 2019 is so large because it has all of these cars from Ford. So I right. agree. I don't, I don't think it's a good idea, but at the same time, all four of those cars from Ford have been withering on the vine. And I, at this point, if Ford didn't have replacements uh, ready to go that were competitive, um, you know, what are they going to do with them? Just let them keep sitting on the vine. So I, you know, they, they back themselves into a corner. I think uh, they shouldn't have let it, they shouldn't have let it, got gotten this bad um so right and i wouldn't be surprised if in a few years we start to see some offerings trickle back um because when you put all your eggs in one basket as automakers have seen in the past <clears throat> 2009 it, it can end up very bad with one small turn especially if in the next two years uh, or three years before ford's electrification plan really gets into gear uh, if gas prices shoot up and they don't have a small car or a fuel efficient car to offer, uh, and all they're offering are um, crossovers um, and SUVs, and even if they have plug in versions of those, those are going to be really expensive. If they don't have a small, uh, affordable 
efficient car to offer, they're going to be in a very bad spot. So um, they're, I think they're leaving themselves in a very vulnerable position in the short term because of that. Jeff, I'm interested to hear what your pick is. Mine is a little less reasonable, I guess. So the Alfa Romeo 4C Coupe. Mm, yours is emotional. Yeah. Well, the, the spider is sticking around, which is good at least, even though that's not the better of the two. It's definitely the worst. But the 4C, man, that car is just so much fun. It is. It drives like a go-kart. It sounds like a go-kart. It's just, I mean, it's it's arguably one of the most fun cars I've driven uh, in the past few years. Mm. I've never driven one, so I'm very jealous uh, of the experience. But I did see one on the road just last week, and God, is it a head turner. I don't know how people get themselves into it, but uh, it looks <laughs> it is so very small. Very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. It looks great. I mean, it's, it's the current, I mean, alphas in general have always been beautiful, but the current styling i think between that and the julia and the stelvio just looks really great does alpha really need a sports car like that probably not um and if they did it should probably be better because this was just kind of stereotypical alfa romeo you know had issues was falling apart <laughs> right. i think every i think i've driven it four times both the coupe and the convertible you know two coupes two convertibles and Every time it was broken, there was something wrong with it. Either it was the key or the roof was broken or the radio was falling out. It's just, it, it, they can't figure it out. But man, that car is just, it's so much fun and it looks great. I will say it's its very nice that, and I'm speaking from a U.S. perspective uh, with the Julia and the Stelvia, that I really do feel in those cars, even though they're more practical forms, a sedan and, and, a, and a crossover SUV, I feel the Alfa Romeo DNA. Those are the best handling vehicles in their segment. Um, and and like I said, I can't um, comment on driving the 4C, but I can only imagine what that is like distilled down into a sports car because it's awesome when it's it's you know in uh, vehicle forms that aren't even designed to be sporty, like like a sedan and an SUV. Um, I so I like I said I'm super jealous and, and that's a great choice and I and I like that it's an emotional one. Um, I kind of have an emotional choice too, but for a different reason. Uh, I'm going to pick the Chevy Cruze, uh, which is Chevy's compact sedan that they've been selling for a couple generations. Um, you know, before that was the Cavalier, uh, which did, you know nobody cried when the Cavalier died. Uh, but I remember when the Cruze launched. I loved the Cruze that first gen. Um, it, I thought it was a great. Uh, effort uh, by an American company in this compact, uh, very competitive uh, compact car class. Uh, I remember, in fact, there was an Eco Edition that had a particularly efficient four-cylinder gas engine, and it only came with a manual transmission. And that thing was so smooth and so quiet. It was like a little luxury car. And the thing got diesel levels of fuel economy, like we're talking 50 miles per gallon. Um, it was an amazing little car. Unfortunately, I don't think the second generation cruise was as well received as the first and sales started to flag. Um, they brought the cruise hatchback in and that didn't do anything. And the cruise is kind of forever linked with the Chevy Volt, uh, the plug-in hybrid with the 50 mile range. And as much as I love that car too, with the Chevy Bolt, the full electric here, you know, they, they kind of lost, um, uh, you know, the momentum and, and the reason for the, the Volt to, to be around. So it kind of made sense if, if the Volt is going away and that's um, on the same platform as the, the Cavalier, that the Cavalier would go away. Now, the reason it's emotional, um, for, it, for me at least, is I live in Cleveland and the um, Chevy Cruze was built not far away in Lordstown, Ohio. Um, and every time I would go visit, uh, my brother-in-law in Pittsburgh, we would drive by the Lordstown plant and it's got this huge mural on it that says home of the cruise. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a big plant in a small town and, uh, with Chevy, um, and GM deciding to cancel the, um, cruise, this plant is going idle. Uh, now, we don't know that it's closing necessarily, but that's kind of the writing on the wall. And there's, you know, thousands of people who are going to lose their jobs. So it's just, you know, when we when we do these slideshows of the, you know, the 17, 18, 19 cars that are going to die each year, 
Um, sometimes there aren't, you know, whole plants that close because of, because of them, but sometimes there are like in this case, and it really just sucks that, um, that's part of the business. Um, and it was a good car. Um, you know, it, it deserved, uh, I think based on the first generation, at least it deserved to stick around and it just got caught out. So, um, so that's my choice. Um, we would love to hear what you all think about this um, with the cars dying um, in 2019. Like I said, you can go on motorone.com to find our slideshow of the cars, trucks, and SUVs being discontinued in 2019. We'll, um, we'll actually try to put that um, in the slider at the top of the homepage uh, when this debuts. Uh, so that you guys can find it easily. Uh, but you can also find us um, on Facebook and Twitter at MotorOne.com, uh, where the discussion about this will continue. And of course, on our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find uh, Jeff, Chris, and I in the comments, along with the other writers and editors. Uh, so coming up, we are going to find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, but before the break, I want to remind everyone that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, so why not hit the subscribe button now so you never miss a show. So before we talk about what we're all driving this week, I want to bring up one more news topic, and it's about the Aston Martin Vantage AMR. So uh, Chris, you wrote that up for uh, the site. Why don't you give us the lowdown on the car that debuted this week? Sure. I mean, it's um, it's the Aston that uh, we thought was coming, that we knew was coming, that was teased. Um, it's got the same horsepower as the regular Vantage. The big thing here is that um, the manual transmission is back in the Vantage. And not only is it back, it, it's, it feels like Aston Martin is actually bragging that they've brought it back. And I mean, I, I love manual transmissions as much as anybody. Um, it's a seven speed dog leg. So first gear is over to the left, like you have in the, uh, in the V12 and, uh, and that lines up all, all the other gears in a, in a dual H pattern, which Aston says, I mean, that's where people are going to be shifting anyways. And I mean, they're not wrong. A 500 horsepower car first gear is like for pulling up steep hills. And that's pretty much about it. Um, by going with the manual transmission and they also add a little bit of carbon fiber, um, the weight is way down on the AMR. So it's, uh, I think it's about 200 pounds lighter. What's interesting though, is that Aston Martin listed as being about a half a second slower to 60 miles an hour. Top speed is still the same. I think 195. Um, but I mean, you can, you can owe that up to the manual, not being able to shift it quite as quick as the automatic gearbox. Um, the good news for the save the manual crowd is that yes, this, uh, this AMR is a limited edition model, but once all 200 are sold, the manual transmission will be an option on the regular vantage. Um, so that aside, uh, they, they do a little bit of work with the suspension. Um, uh, the engine is still the same, but the, apparently they have it tuned a little bit differently. So it's got a, a broader torque curve so you can make better use of the manual. Um, and that's about it. Other than it's going to be 185 grand, um, which is which is it's a little steep to to go with the manual. I think the I think the regular Vantage is uh, about 150 or so. But I mean, it's it's the AMR. It's the limited edition model. You get it in the sterling green, and uh, I mean, and it looks great. And um, I kind of mentioned in the article sometimes it's not about being faster. It's it's about enjoying the journey. And for those who love rowing their gears. Here you go. I agree with that. I uh, I'm not one of those people that believes a manual makes a car better. You know, inherently, like nobody needs a Yaris with a manual. Um, but I think this it makes so much sense on this car, and especially if you said it's it's limited to what 200 with the manual, Chris. Right. There's 200. Um, the final 59 are actually going to be uh, they're they're calling them the Vantage 59, and it's it's a special tribute model to. Uh, Oh, when when Aston won the twenty four hour of Le Mans, which uh, nineteen fifty nine, I believe. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think they'll for sure sell out of every one of those those limited models. Uh, that car, I mean, from what I know, from what our other editors have done, have driven that car. It's uh, it's great, and the manual probably only makes it better. So. I'm definitely not really part of the save the manuals crowd. I mean, look, it's they, they've already shrunk down to a minuscule fraction of the amount of cars sold in the U S 
And they usually either appear on very, very cheap cars or, you know, sports cars that still make room for them. For me, it's not even just like a a manual isn't inherently better than an automatic or a dual clutch or whatever, Uh, because there are a lot of manuals out there that just aren't that great. So I, you know, even if I'm more engaged with the driving experience, if the experience of shifting the manual isn't good, then I'm not exactly happy with that increased level of engagement. And and you look at the, the numbers here, the car is 209 pounds lighter, uh, but yet it accelerates to 60 half a second slower. That tells you exactly how good automated transmissions have become. And, you know, if you're looking for speed um, and precision, then the manual isn't the way to go. And it's not even it's not even accurate to say the manual is X slower than um, the dual clutch or the automatic because it's not the manual that's slow it's the human that's slow and that that's really the the limiting factor in that case but uh, look I, I love a good manual in a good car but I also don't always love a manual um, there are times when I'm just tired and you know I've always wondered why and I'm not I'm not a mechanical engineer I don't have an answer for this but why you can't why no one's ever invented like something that that can be an actual mechanical um manual transmission but then be put into a automatic mode has that ever happened maybe i'm just well i mean like I, history. I, 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 I mean a modern dual clutch uh gearbox i, I mean that's it's it's doesn't work like a traditional automatic transmission um, but it but does it offer work, the, it doesn't work like a traditional manual either though does it because you're not rowing not, gears you're not using a third pedal well you're you, you don't have that mechanical direct connection um, the the transmission is still doing all the work uh, but you are controlling the gears manually with the with the paddles and uh, so many people that I've talked to over the years their their big uh, defense for the manual is I want control of the gears well I mean with a dual clutch you still have control of the gears. You can hold third gear for as long as you want. You can bounce it off the rev limiter. You can downshift to second. You can upshift to fourth. It's just doing it so much quicker. But the car is doing it. The computers are doing right. it. Your hand isn't. Right. You're not physically actuating a, a foot pedal with a cable connected to a clutch that uh, that then disconnects the transmission so your hand can move a physical lever moving actual. You know, it's it's... It's uh, it gets kind of pedantic after a while, I think. But uh, there's that level of involvement that a lot of people still enjoy, and I mean, I'm one of them. Um, but this day and age, yeah, I mean, if you want to go fast, it's not really the way to do it. Well, do you guys do you guys remember Detroit Electric when they re- brought came back in 2012 or whatever it was? They had a strange gearbox where it was a it was a manual, right? Or it looked like a manual. But I think you only had to press the clutch going into first. And then anything after first, you could shift without pressing the clutch. And you could stop like a normal automatic at a uh, at a red light or whatever. And you didn't have to... I, I think. I mean, I just remember it being super strange. But that sounds like a good next step, right? If you want to keep the manual around, you have to sort of reinvent it and make it easier i know that sounds terrible to a lot of people but you really do have to make it easier because kids these days don't want to drive manuals they just want simplicity and well and it could even be something like you look at um continuously variable transmissions today when they first came out you know a lot of people didn't like them because the experience of them was so different from a normal stepped transmission so what did automakers do they just programmed in the software i'll make the cvt lurch a little af- at so many rpms to make it feel like a traditional uh transmission with gears i wonder if we'll get to the point where we have a stick shift in a car maybe we even have a clutch pedal but it's all just a simulation and the the transmission is is still doing all the work it's just letting us participate by um engaging it at certain points using a simulated stick shift and a simulated clutch pedal you know i wonder if we'll we'll get to that point so that people can have their manual their experience of a manual transmission, but then all of it can be turned off and everything go back to an automatic when they don't want it. 
I, um, I got to be honest. I really hope that never happens. I, I, that just sounds so ridiculous. It's, it, it, it's like it's like putting the fake brake pedal on the passenger side so your mother-in-law has something to hit. Would you be surprised if it happened, though? <laughs> it, it just seems like something that would definitely happen in the next <laughs> five to ten years to me. Uh, it just seems the way of things uh, as things get even more digital um, and less mechanical, less um, analog. All transmission advancements, it seems, in the last 10 to 20 years has been, well, let me say in the uh, in automatic transmissions, has been making these transmissions disappear. Like when I review a car, I hardly have anything to say about the trans- the automatic transmission usually unless it stands out in a negative way. Like usually they just fall into the background and the thing shifts uh, quietly and without uh, a big lurch and it, you know, downshifts when it's supposed to and knows what gear to go into. Honestly, most transmissions do that fairly well. You know, it's only the ones that really screw that up that I feel in a review that I need to call out and say that this transmission, you know, does this or that pretty wonky. Um, it seems like transmission um, development has really gone into making these things fall away into the background. Um, so, um, well, hopefully we'll get a chance to, or one of us will get a chance to drry the Aston Martin Vantage AMR with its uh, seven-speed manual transmission soon, and we can tell you all about it. Um, in the meantime, though, we're going to move on to talk about uh, what we're driving this week. And Jeff, I know you've had a very good week with a couple of cars you've driven, so why don't we start with you? Well, my, my press car right, that I have for the week is the Mazda Miata RF, which is a great little car. I mean, that... that with the new, with the updated engine, it's more powerful. It drives well, uh, even though it's an automatic. Which speaking of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's great. I mean, it's awesome. But the, I mean, probably the biggest thing I've driven in a while. I went down to Homestead, Miami, to drive the new Ferrari 488 Pista yesterday. Whoa! Yeah. What? Um, first of all, what was it like? And second of all. You 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 have the opportunity to tell us what it was like in the dry and in the wet since I know yeah. <laughs> that the forecast yesterday was not very good. Yeah, well, a, a big section of our track time got rained out, um, and a lot of the rain happened when I was on the track, which is, you know, the tires that they had on that car was not for wet. <laughs> not, not rain uh, tires, yeah. Yeah, so, it, I mean, that car is phenomenal it's ridiculous it's only the second ferrari i've driven uh we drove the portofino a few months ago and that was fine but the pista is like another level of good i mean you get 710 horsepower 568 pound feet of torque zero to 16 like 2.7 seconds wow it's crazy wow and and so were you driving it on the road course section so you got to experience a lot of the turns and and the handling yeah so we drove the road course of homestead miami um and, you know, they, they run you through a briefing before you hit the track. And I've driven a few tracks. And when I look at that one on video, I'm like, oh, pff, that's easy, right? That looks super simple. few turns, some straights, not hard. You get in the car, right? And you have Ferrari instructor next to you. And they're telling you everything to do. And obviously, you know, I'm botching every corner the first go. Because you go in so confident thinking this is going to be an easy track. And this car... As for as good as it is, it's so fast. Like you, you really don't understand how fast it is until you hit that first corner, and you need to like stand on the brakes for it to stop fully. <laughs> I well, I imagine it's so. I mean, it's it's at another level. Like you, you probably, I would imagine because my my high performance driving level is particularly low. I mean, uh, that I know when I get in cars that have you know seven hundred horsepower. Like it freaks me out because I know that this car can do more than I can control. <laughs> like, and, and oh, especially when you have the Ferrari instructor uh, in the car with you, I'm sure. I'm sure that doesn't make you nervous whatsoever. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I mean, it's a different. It's a, I mean, you know, you have Hellcats, right? The Hellcats are cool. A lot of that is just paper, right? Like it's on paper. Like you, you show that number to people, and you're like, wow, 707 horsepower. None of it's usable. I mean, on the road, especially, you can't use like a quarter of it, right? But the Ferrari and another car like the McLaren 720S, which really is the only car I can compare this Ferrari to because they're both just stupid fast and stupid technical on the track. It's all usable on the track. It's just every 
ounce of horsepower you you squeeze out of that car every you know all the braking power you can possibly muster from your legs like it's it's crazy you get out of that car after a few laps and your legs are like jello because your left leg you're bracing you know the the foot well uh, and then your right leg you're just standing on the brake the whole time so it's wow. it's an insane car yeah well, I'm looking forward uh, to that write-up um, that you get. So um, we'll keep that in mind for the the coming weeks. Uh, Chris, I think I heard that you also had some weather issues uh, where you are. Uh, why don't you tell us about tell us where you are and what vehicles you drove as a result? Well, I mean, Jeff is is experiencing an amazing vehicle, and I don't want to brag, um, but here in uh, South Dakota's uh, beautiful black hills where i hold the motor one news desk out here i was driving a snowplow this week john <laughs> so it is now early may <laughs> and you are still getting inches inches upon inches of snow i mean it's not it's not absolutely unheard of out here i'm in an area i'm in rapid city right here at the central black hills so it's uh they call it the banana belt out here we'll get blasts of cold air and then we'll get blasts of warm air um the last few years i've had several times in february january march where it's been 60 and beautiful um on the flip side of that i've also had i, I think the latest snow i've seen out here um was may 8th so uh, and that was that was a, a few years back this week was was kind of rough we had uh, we had about a 10 inch snowfall all total starting tuesday through yesterday but i mean it's 60 today and it's already melted so but i can um, knowing you chris and this is why i love you uh <laughs> i imagine that despite the snow you still drove a wildly inappropriate vehicle uh for the weather uh so tell us about that there there is a project mustang in the garage it's a 95 mustang gt convertible that um i don't drive all the time but yes i absolutely drive it through all weather just because it's hilarious fun um it's not the my first rodeo with a mustang in the winter um but as i'm sure our uh, our motor one.com listeners know it comes down to tires and a good Absolutely. set of snow tires right a good set of snow tires on a car like that will take you places you would never never dream of now i actually took the snow tires off the car a few weeks back because hey, i was like hey problem, it's right it, it's 70 degrees let's go out and have a good time but um but no, I, I, I enjoy the Mustang. It's a, I bought it a couple years ago. Um, the SN95s are really at the bottom of their depreciation curve right now. So they're a great car that you can get into inexpensively that you can still have some V8 fun with. Now, uh, they were originally only rated at 215 horsepower back in the day. Um, the, they were down a little bit from the Fox body. Ford changed a little bit of, uh, of work on the intake, which restricted it a little bit. So, I mean, I've done a little bit of work to it. Mine's around 250. Um, I had I did a dyno about a year and a half ago. So, I mean, it's not it's not fast. I'm not winning stoplight to stoplight battles, but uh, it's loud, it's fun, and it's a work in progress. It's the last year for the old school five liter um, cam in block Windsor V8 that goes all the way back to the original muscle car era. And um, and I, actually, I road tripped it a couple years ago. And I was expecting it to break my back going from South Dakota to Michigan, and it it was surprisingly comfortable. I I rather enjoyed it. So, uh, I, a little bit of seat time in that this week. Now that the weather is getting nicer, the top's going to be down a little bit more, and it's a work in progress. And uh, it's just a fun car to have. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's not a Ferrari, but. No, but I tell you what, I, I see you in that car on social media all the time and you look like you're having as fun as somebody driving a Ferrari. So um, so it's definitely a great car. Um, my uh, what I've been driving this past week is um, the Hyundai Tucson, which isn't particularly special or noteworthy in any way compared to your choices. Uh, but I did pick it. I picked it up from the airport uh, on Tuesday because I got back from a trip and I and I drove it home and man, it 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 hit the spot after being on a plane for three hours and traveling. Um, and the thing that jumped out at me and kind of my first impression of it, that is probably going to feed into my review of the Tucson is that it's not, it's not a new compact crossover. Like if you, if you line it up against all the compact crossovers on sale, I would say it's, it's getting long in the tooth. Um, it's, it's been around, I think it had a mid cycle refresh, but it's at the end of its, of its product cycle. But it is super smooth. Uh, the engine, particularly, is um, 
very smooth. It doesn't doesn't make a lot of noise, doesn't make a lot of vibration, um, which makes it very easy and comfortable um, to drive, um, which I appreciate, actually. You know, I, I know a, a lot of enthusiasts focus on speed. I, I actually like focusing on noise, vibration, and harshness, and um, smoothness, and just overall refinement. And and the Tucson is surprisingly refined for its both its age and its segment. So I'm enjoying it so far, but it's only been a couple days. Um, and I, too, will have a review out on that in, in a couple weeks. Um, hopefully, though, I'll get something more exciting to talk about next week. Um, okay, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Jeff on Twitter at Not a Boat Captain, uh, and I'm we we have to devote a segment to how you got that name on Twitter. I'm not going to do it right <laughs> now, but uh, we have to do it sometime. Uh, and you can also follow Chris at Ch Writing on Twitter. You can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Um, thank you two uh, for being here on the show with me this week. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. And of course, thank all of you out there for listening. Uh, We'll see you next week.